This paper is co-authored with Sean Gailmard, and it's uh, part of a, a, a larger project on bureaucratic hierarchies, which is the title in the program, and of course, in meta fashion, it's cheap talk. It's not actually titled that anymore. It's titled uh, something about advice and decision making. And so what is the question at the heart of this paper and the broader project is, essentially, we were interested in uh, two phenomena and putting them together, chocolate, peanut butter, Reese's peanut butter cup. Uh, we have lots of models of information pooling and aggregation, and we have lots of models, not quite as many, although depending on how you view it, you can make a lot of them in your mind, of power sharing, uh, the allocation of power within uh, collective choice uh, institutions. So we're going to put them together, right? And then just like sodium and water is going to explode, and everyone's going to run out of the room. Um, so in particular, we're interested in situations which we think are, are more descriptively realistic in an important way, not just the, uh, pure description, but uh, uh, of bureaucratic policy making, uh, which actually earlier talk, uh, the first talk, Hatfield's talk is sort of online with this, is uh, uh, situations where policy decisions are actually made by many agents in a sense simultaneously. And so there isn't one uber policy maker, even one uber policy body that makes a single policy decision that that goes out there, we add omega to it, and then we get Y, the policy outcome. Rather, public policy is the aggregation of lots of individual decisions. Uh, and we're going, to out, we're going to consider a model in which at least a jure uh, uh, authority to do that is distributed among many people. And so, uh, so everybody has their own, uh, potentially their own little bailiwick to make decisions in. Okay, and, and in terms of decentralization, we're also going to think about a world in which all of these agents have some policy relevant information. By policy relevant, we mean it's uh, relevant actually to every decision. Okay, that keeps it interesting. It's not just relevant to their own decision. Um, and very quick and dirty, aggregating all that information would be in their interest, period. Okay, if they could somehow shove the information into an, an aggregator and, and get it back out truthfully, uh, everybody would benefit. Okay, and so that's the kind of world that we're in. Uh, the problem is, of course, the policy decisions here do affect all agents in the sense that they're all making public policy decisions. They all have some preferences over those decisions. And accordingly, that will lead to a strategic incentive to perhaps obfuscate one's own information if prior to making the decisions, you're trying to, uh, in a cheap talk way, for example, share that information. Okay, so that's the kind of world we're in. There's lots of applications. Um, before I talk about a couple of those, what are the big points? Uh, the first one, which I think is kind of surprising, and, and we may or may not have time now, but you know, there's always beer later to talk about. There's a, uh, transparency can hinder information aggregation in our world, and our conception of transparency is actually a little different than the typical electoral accountability notion of transparency, which I realize, you know, ex post, so it's a new innovation. John misunderstood what the word meant, and so he's going to redefine it. Um, the second is that wider spans of control can actually um, intensify, and by, the, by wider spans of control, I mean more people are reporting their signals to you, okay? You have more agents who are saying, hey, guess what I heard, blank. More people reporting to you intensifies the effect of preference divergence on information transmission, okay? So the more signals you have, the more likely it is a randomly drawn agent will have an incentive to obfuscate uh, to you if you believe that he or she's being truthful, okay? Which is, I think, a, a novel finding, um, maybe. <laughs> we'll claim it is for now. And then finally, delegated discretionary authority, which is the institutional design aspect of our model, can ameliorate um, both of these effects, but it, uh, but it, can, it can never eliminate it. Okay, so uh, there is no panacea. However, giving agents power to make their own decisions can lead to, in a quite intuitive way for those in the, in the inside baseball of these models, in an intuitive way it leads to them having an incentive to be truthful. Okay. So, very quickly, uh, I have three examples. Okay, they're empirical. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, the first of these, uh, and, and actually they're not all in the paper anymore, but uh, right, so maybe eventually they'll all be gone. Um, but they're examples of at least what we were trying to model originally. Um, the first is that federal advisory committees. These are important in the sense that there are a lot of them and they're costly, and so somebody believes that they're worth the time. Uh, and they have potentially large policy effects. What they are in a nutshell, these are typically combinations of federal bureaucrats, sometimes elected officials, although very rarely, and then typically a lot of citizens, often with some expertise or maybe just a tinfoil hat, who get together and meet and discuss policy questions in a specific domain. Okay, so the one of the most high profile, there's two very high profile ones. There's one in particular at the FDA that you may know of, occasionally comes up in the news because the FDA goes against their recommendation to make something that's usually related to abortion available to people. Okay, and the committee is basically a lot of doctors, scientists, who knows, who, who, rec who do the studies and they say, we recommend that this drug be available, and then the FDA says no, and that's when it gets covered. 
They also say, we make recommend that this make, be made available. The FDA says yes, and it doesn't get covered in the news. The other high profile one, at least to me, every time there was a space shuttle disaster, we saw the Space Shuttle Advisory Committee, to be quick and dirty about it. These are engineers, scientists, um, risk analysts, and so forth, who would get together and discuss different things that you could change on the space shuttle uh, with regard to safety and whether it was worth it or not. Okay, and so I don't have time to go into that, but I mean, that talk about like a gold mine, if you ever want to get students interested in bureaucratic politics, um, it's like, we expect that, you know, the value of a life is this. That's what they did. Okay, so that's one example of what we're talking about. And what, what's important about that is these are agents who are brought in precisely because they have decentralized information, and our hope is that they will, in concert with each other and then talking to the bureaucracy, hand those signals over to make policy more precise. The second one, which is definitely not in the paper anymore, and this is something where we're going to go hopefully in the future, or maybe we'll hire one of you to do it in a better way. I'm just kidding. Subdelegation. So in most bureaucracies, and particularly a lot of laws, say the president should do this. And then there's another one, the, the Presidential Subdelegation Act, which says, oh, well, we didn't really mean he has to do all that stuff. He can actually say to somebody else, you have the discretionary authority to do this kind of, you know, uh, administrative job. Okay, so oftentimes exec executive orders, for example, presidents at the beginning of a term will subdelegate subdele subdele a lot of stuff to the Secretary of State. Okay. Um, Subdelegation, I think, raises a lot of interesting questions that I, I'm happy to talk about afterwards. And, um, but it's a very common feature of policymaking organizations, both public and private. Um, one of the best examples in terms of getting it exciting, right, is uh, the idea of czars, uh, which are basically the sort of, sort of informal appointees that have policy advising power, but they clearly have at least the president's informal uh, imprimatur to cajole policymakers to do something in a particular domain. The biggest example of this is Kenneth Feinberg. I shouldn't say the biggest, but the, the best one in my, in my mind, especially from a public law standpoint. So Kenneth Feinberg, of course, was on the 9-11 Victims' Compensation uh, Commission. He basically mediated the claims after 9-11, did, a, I think, a, a bang-up job, it seems. People thought highly. Well, after TARP, when we basically bailed out the financial system and auto companies, People were like, well, we shouldn't be paying fat cats. Who's going to make sure we don't pay fat cats for, for you know, the moral hazard problem they've induced? Kenneth Feinberg. Okay, and he was actually given, through a rule, the power to go and claw back private citizens' salaries. I'm, I'm no lawyer, but I'm, I'm, that seems a little bit squirrely. But anyway, the Department of Treasury said it wasn't. Okay, but again, that was subdelegation to, again, a non-government official in this case. Um, and then finally, what we are really interested in here, uh, specifically within the model, is the idea of top-down transparency and governance. Okay, and so by top-down transparency, I'm alluding to what I said a few minutes ago. By transparency here, we mean <clears throat> When I'm about to report to my superior my own information, do I know the information that the superior already has? I.e., can I go in and look at my dean's files and find all the other reports other faculty have given to him or her before submitting my own report? If I can, that's top-down transparency. Okay? And so uh, one area where we think that this is particularly important are basically quasi-public governance organizations, whether they be water authorities, the Federal Reserve Board, uh, health, uh, healthcare and educational institutions. These people do public policy decision making, right? And the question is, should we be able to see the information they have when we're deciding what to tell them about what we know about the policy area? That's what we're, and again, transparency is a big issue in those areas. So that's what we're aiming at. So accordingly, we're gonna have a two player game. <laughs> this is a big world and so we're gonna look at two people, Jack and Jill, okay. Um, the model is more general, but the intuition's all from two, and, and that's great. Uh, essentially, there's a principal and an agent in the baseline case, and there's a state of nature theta that's uniformly distributed between zero and one. You're welcome. And then uh, player I and N, for e each player, gets a private signal, uh, zero or one. That's it. And basically, we'll, we'll have a slide that we'll fly through really quickly. Again, you're welcome. Which is basically zero tells you that theta is likely to be less than a half, expected value one third. SI equal one says likely to be bigger than a half, expected value actually equal to two thirds. That's all it is, okay? So you're just saying, is it likely to be hot tomorrow? Yes, no, okay? That's the, uh, the nature of the information. And then each player will make a policy decision, YI, which is again in the real line, just a, just a number. And again, classic quadratic loss, Crawford Sobel style preferences here. You have some bias that you have as your preference. So you, kind, you wanna target your policy at theta, but you wanna miss it by a certain amount, okay? So you're maybe more aggressive or less aggressive with regard to the true state of nature, maybe one way to think about it. Our innovation here, right, we're gonna blow some minds, is that every, we're not, we're borrowing this too, is that everybody cares about everybody else's uh, policy. Sorry, this should be a J here. I apologize, these should be J's. Everybody, every I cares about every other J's decision 
according to a weight alpha j. Okay, so I have a certain weight that affects your utility in a sense. My decision and it's matched with theta, right, affects you in some way. And that's the higher that alpha sub john is, the more my authority is. Don't like it? I understand why, but we're going to go with that. That is the measure of authority. More, the more you care about my decision, the more authority I have. And this isn't a discussion of power in the 1950s, so just let's run with that, okay? So if you have alpha equals zero, then all your decision can possibly do is convey some information. It doesn't have any effect, and that's a cheap talk world, okay? So if alpha sub j is zero, then j is just cheap talking. Here's what I do, right? It's me talking about real world politics. You know, I'll tell you what Obama should do. And you're like, oh, my alpha john is zero. Okay, sequence of play, we're gonna draw the state of nature, and then again in this very easy stripped down two player world, agent A will then either observe his own signal or his own signal and the principal signal. If he observes both, that's the top down transparency case. Okay, so he gets to observe at least his own signal, and again, if it's transparent, he gets to observe the principles as well. After that, he chooses his policy YA, Principal P observes YA and FP. Again, the top-down transparency is common knowledge if it's the case. And in fact, it's common knowledge if it's not the case. Okay, and then chooses YP. The world blows up, but right beforehand, everybody gets their payoffs. Okay, related models, if you credit where credit is due, in particular, this Galeotti, Giglino, and Squintani model, we're stealing everything good from it. Okay, and it's a very nice paper. Their paper, I won't, I'm happy to talk later about the differences. The biggest difference is that their model is all simultaneous messaging, and ours is not. Doing and Squintani have a great paper on it. Penn has written a great paper, and I've kind of messed it up, uh, that uses it, that looks at a, 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 a related but different question. Okay, this is the math that we, I'm happy to pause, and everyone's nodding, keep going, okay. So it's all, that, that's part of the algebra, ma you know, magic in the paper, it's not, not ours, not that fascinating. Makes the math easy, makes it all algebraic. Couple of innovations in terms of the, or not innovations, but decisions in terms of the modeling strategy here. We're only analyzing pure strategy, perfect Bayesian equilibria. That's it, okay? I'm not interested in the mixed strategy equilibria for lots of reasons, okay? Mostly career concerns, right? <laughs> I, that would take a long time. And also I think from the standpoint of mechanism design in this constrained environment, I just don't think that's the right world to look at, okay? There's a lot of things we've already done to try to get to pure strategy, so why then just throw it all aside and say, now we're gonna allow for mixed strategies. I mean, if I wanted to do that, I could have used a, a more general uh, informational environment. We are interested in truthful equilibrium among these, okay? And that's in, in the sense that I'm going to focus on that from the mechanism design-ish kind of aspect, okay? The principal is going to be interested in getting the information from the, from the agent, as you'll see. And that, again, would be separating equilibria here. And then, uh, again, here from, it represents the optimal behavior from an ex-ante social welfare standpoint. So everybody, just to, you know, dot, 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 go all the way to the end of the perfect Bayesian equilibrium, everybody's always going to set their own policy at, at, with an expected value equal to expected value of theta plus their bias. That bias cannot be taken away from anybody's policy making because it's unilateral authority. Okay, and accordingly, the biases don't really affect social welfare in the standpoint of selecting between different equilibria. Rather, everybody has a common interest in reducing variance of anyone's decision, and that is reduced by having more information transmitted. So, really quickly, the pure cheap talk. So this will be the advisory committee world. Okay, the first result is it, again, this is why we make all these really strong assumptions, because we get really nice things here which are just like, you know, I, I know how to work with them. They're just fractions. So, in the cheap talk world, suppose just for a second to step outside the model, uh, there are M minus one other players who are handing over their signals truthfully to the principal. Maybe in, in equilibrium, maybe by you know, force, it doesn't matter. And the principal is known to have those M signals, his own plus M minus one other ones. Okay, what is the incentive compatibility condition for existence of a separating equilibrium? It's exactly this. The preference divergence has to be smaller than one over two M plus six. Okay, so this is our span of control result. Okay, the more signals, the more information the principal has, the harder it is, speaking loosely, for an agent to uh, be uh, truthful to the principal in the sense that it, the range of preferences for which truthfulness is actually incentive compatible, given that they're believed to be truthful, is narrower. Okay, fine, all right. Why is that, you might ask? Well, the intuition's actually pretty clear once you see pictures, which I won't have time to show you, and maybe, maybe the pictures will make it worse. My pictures are typically kind of spacey. But what's happening is, as the principal has more signals that are truthful or not, the fact, the fact is that your signal to the principal will have a smaller effect on his or her 
ultimate policy decision. Okay, and accordingly, in Crawford Sobel style words, if, if that is small enough, then you guys no longer are playing a common value game in terms of telling the truth. Okay, I want to shade you a little closer to me. What's the distribution oh. of signals? The, what do you, okay. Uh, the distribution of signals, we, we have theta is distributed uniformly, and then we're going to have a beta distribution after. Or, so basically the probability that you're going to get a, uh, the probability you get a one is equal to theta. That makes sense? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you think I look? Like? Do I look crazy? <laughs> oh, man, I like you. We're going to party later. Yeah, they're independent. Sorry, they, I'm being glib, but yes, they are independent. And no, we're not going to generalize that. Okay, <laughs> that is independent. Okay, so, any other questions? Right, so, an interesting thing here with Cheap Talk is a knife edge case, and that's really great for a lot of reasons, and here's an example of that. So, it turns out that in this Cheap Talk environment, the incentive compatibility condition for agent A to be truthful to the principal is actually completely independent of top-down transparency. Regardless of whether he can observe the signals or not, the previous one over two M plus six, that is the incentive compatibility condition. But this is only true in cheap talk, which I think is kind of neat, maybe, in the process of doing this, because at first you're like, well, this is why we don't ask top-down transparency. Well, in a second we're gonna show you why we do, because this is gonna break as soon as the agent actually has some skin in the game and his or her message has direct policy implications. Okay? So that's corollary one. What's also really interesting, is, I mean, again, it's all because of the informational environment we're in. That's not something to take home and, and, and teach your children. This is, and, you know, top-down transparency doesn't matter if you're just talking. On, on line with the question about the signal, Right, this informational environment is nice. It's very, very nice, and so uh, that, that is fragile, but yet at the same time, uh, I think it's, it's interesting because we're about to break it. Okay, when the agent has independent authority now, remember that the Y sub A that he or she sets that the principal will then observe actually has impact, okay? So if alpha A is positive, then the choice of the policy by the agent will affect him or her directly in terms of its match with the true realization of theta. Okay, and so hopefully intuitively, it's going to be easier to incentivize uh, truthfulness when you actually say to the agent, your message means something now. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do in terms of mechanism design, we're gonna assume that alpha P plus alpha A has to equal one, and P prior to observing anything, big deal here, prior to observing anything, then hands over some of the alpha, his alpha P to, a, to the agent prior to the game being played and then plays it. Understanding, you know, understanding the equilibrium that we've be played and so forth. I am getting incredibly parched and it's, <laughs> that's on the equilibrium path. This is a really interesting world and I'm happy to talk afterwards about why it's interesting, but it um, comes up in the paper with Maggie in particular where we proved something kind of startling, I think. Um, but here, just by, to, for the modeling exercise, we are only interested in equilibria in which the agent chooses naively, sequentially rational. So I. They send, a, they send a message for S equal one that is equal to two thirds plus their beta sub A, okay? And if they get SI equal zero, they, they choose one third plus their beta sub A, okay? I'm happy to talk afterwards about what could you do if you don't do that? But that's the right, in my mind, uh, again, better over an adult beverage, but that's, that's the right modeling choice. Okay, it's definitely the one we made. <laughs> it's the right one to describe the one we made, okay. Top-down transparency, really quickly, in this world, it turns out you'll only ever have two on the equilibrium path because the, the principal will know his own signal, but there are now three possible choices for the agent. That's a big deal, as we'll talk about later from welfare perspective, right? Because now the agent has basically SI, SA plus SP is what he or she cares about, so there's zero, one, or two. And with top-down transparency, truthful revelation is incentive compatible as long as alpha sub A is bigger than this, okay? And if you do some quick math, you'll realize that before, our condition was basically one eighth with the M equal one. Okay, well, one eighth means that alpha A can be zero. As soon as the divergence is more than one eighth, you actually have to give some skin in the game to the agent to incentivize truthfulness, okay? As, so luckily this matches up with the previous analysis. More authority, of course, implies that truthfulness is incentive compatible with greater preference divergence, that's nice. Turns out after some math, if you ask would the principal want to hand over the requisite, i.e. the lowest level of alpha to induce truthfulness, or would he prefer to just set alpha A equals zero and say I'm gonna ignore, you're gonna babble, and I'm gonna not care because you don't have any policy impact. 
he wants to hand over, he or she wants to hand over authority as long as the preference divergence is less than this. Which of course everybody's like, yeah, of course, 3 plus root of 41 over 48. Yeah, I just saw that in the math. Uh, anyway, that's 0.196. That, of course, is bigger than 0.125, and so accordingly, there is a non-trivial region of preference divergence in which the principal would say, you know what, I'm willing to incur some cost in terms of policy loss because I'm going to hand over some authority to you that you're going to use in your biased way, but you're going to use it truthfully, and I'm going to be able to use that information to then set my own policy more accurately, okay? However, for, for sufficiently extreme preference divergence, I'm not going to hand over anything because the policy cost in terms of mean loss is too big. I, the, variance is not, the variance I gain from your one signal is not sufficient to warrant the uh, divergence of policy from my own one signal based unbiased policy decision. Make sense? No? Yeah. In the case of op opacity, where the agent doesn't observe the principal's information, going through the same math, we find out that in the opaque case, and the reason for this is, well, I'll come back to it later, but in the opaque case, the level of requisite authority you have to hand over to the agent in order to induce truthfulness by the agent is less than the amount you have to hand over in the transparency case, okay? It's easier to buy, to buy the incentive compatibility of truthfulness in the opaque case, okay? And so, and this turns out to be the root of a cubic, of course, right? And it's around 0.2, okay? Is the cut point at which the principal will no longer be willing to grant the requisite authority. This makes sense to everybody? So, Right now, both of these analyses have treated transpa top-down transparency as exogenous, right? It's either top-down transparent or it's not. When it's top-down transparent, it's costlier and therefore, generally speaking, less in the principal's interest to go after truthfulness by the agent because he has to hand over more authority to get the truthfulness and the reason where he has to hand over any authority at all. Okay, in the opaque case, he's willing to do more of it, but again, there's sufficiently large biases. He will not hand over any authority to uh, elicit truthfulness. Okay? So. How much time do I have? I haven't been watching for time. That's a good, credible commitment. Ethan? You have uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> You're like, ah, seven. Okay. <laughs> right, so. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> right. So what's really going on here is that basically when, the, um, when, this top, when there's top-down transparency, the fact of the matter is that it's less costly for a, um, in terms of policy uh, divergence, the degree to which you have to manipulate and incur a direct cost on yourself through your, mis you know, through your manipulation of policy, it's less costly to do that when it's transparent because you only have to move policy by one third, I mean by one fourth as opposed to one third. That's what's driving this result. And so, you know, I could present a more general one, but as the information the agent has goes up, the, the, the policy loss they have to incur to manipulate the principle is smaller. Okay, because it's common knowledge that the agent has a lot of information. So you be like, oh yeah, no, I know, you think I might have gotten 15 or 16 or 17, I actually got 18 positive signals, right? Just, just a little bit extra over 50. Okay, and so as the number of signals the agent has, in this case, he happens to hold the principles, but it doesn't matter whose information he holds, as he holds more, he can manipulate in these equilibria with a smaller divergence. Accordingly, you have to give them more skin in the game to elicit truthfulness. Because the incentive to manipulate is, fixed, is hold, held constant. That, that effect is always the same. Okay. All right, so there are two countervailing effects that I want to quickly talk you through. The first of which is the top-down transparency is good, obviously, from the social welfare standpoint, because it makes the agent's policy decision more efficient, more precise. The agent's making decisions with two signals as opposed to one, and that's, that's a good thing from the standpoint of, again, everybody's standpoint, because the mean expected location of the policy of the uh, agent is invariant in perfect Bayesian equilibria. Rather, all we can affect is the variance of their decision, the precision. Okay? However, as we just saw, top-down transparency can also require, in those cases where I actually have to give you some skin in the game to elicit truthfulness, I have to pay a larger price in terms of the expected deviation of the total policy outcome from my ideal point to get you to be truthful. Okay? So in the relevant region where we're actually considering handing over authority as the principal, i.e., we have, say, a uh, policy divergence of around one-sixth, Okay, that's too big for us to have cheap talk truthfulness. I have to consider, well, on the one hand, I would like to choose transparency, again, prior to the whole game, because if I'm going to make your decision matter, I'd like your decision to have more signals. I'd like you to use my signal, 
okay? Because I can't affect the expected location of your policy. I can only affect its precision. However, if I choose transparency beforehand, okay, if we're thinking about transparency being endogenous, I also realize that in order to make you actually give me a truthful revelation, right, I'm going to have to hand over more authority to you, and that's bad. Okay, so that's, again, a sketch for why this hopefully is interesting. So we'll talk in a second about which one would they choose, transparency or opacity. Here's just a graph of the um, actual level of you know, cheapest cost, the minimum level of authority you have to grant to somebody um, uh, to get them to be truthful, uh, going in terms of the divergence of uh, beta P minus beta A, that's what that should be. So up through an eighth, I, had, I don't have to give you anything. You'll, you'll be truthful with me in a cheap talk environment. After that, I have to give you some more. Okay, and again, the transparent case, like I said before, I'm going to have to hand over more power to you to get you to be truthful than in the opaque case for any level of divergence where I'm actually handing over authority. And then they both drop to zero at the point that I, earlier, I showed you earlier where the principal is actually like, I don't actually want to hand over authority. It's too costly. Those graphs would just keep going up in terms of what would you have to pay, but this is cut down by the uh, principal's own incentive compatibility uh, condition, if you will. Okay? Make sense? And so again, this is what I was talking about earlier. There is a small divergence between opacity and uh, transparency in terms of how, what, how broad a range of preferences could we, in equilibrium in this kind of mechanism uh, sort of setting, could we see transparency, I'm sorry, could we see uh, truthfulness being elicited by the proper delegation of authority, okay? You'll see a broader, more truthfulness in the opaque case, sort of ironically, than in the transparency case if the principal's the one deciding these authorities. So you might ask, okay, that's great. Now, when would the, would the principal ever choose transparency, right? Transparency is more costly. But at the same time, like I said, transparency is good because the agent's decision will be more precise. And it turns out after some math, I was like figuring that I'm going to get a quartic or something. I ends up with one seventh. So, <laughs> which is great. It's like all this math is like one seventh. So between one eighth and one seventh, you will hand over positive authority and you would choose to hand over positive authority in a transparent environment. Okay, so for moderate preference divergence, I prefer to, to keep information transparent. Again, I, I don't mind making information transparent in a cheap talk world because I don't care what you do. You might as well see it. Doesn't matter, right? This is not the Cheney model. <laughs> and then, after one seventh, the cost of transparency becomes too large. And so I say, you know, I still want your signal for me, right? I want to elicit truthfulness. So up through about point two, I say, I choose opacity because it's cheaper in terms of the policy loss to me, but I am still willing to give you authority sufficient to get you to be truthful. And then finally, past point two, I, I, I go back to transparency. I don't really care. Right? I'm like, you can see it, but you get no authority because you, you and I just cannot speak uh, credibly in a way that makes me better off than me just ignoring you. Okay? This is sort of a model of parenting. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead. Go to college. Um, yeah, that's what, yeah, that's different. Okay. Multiple agents, just really quickly. This is actually on time. This is great. So I have another paper that I'll be presenting in two days in New York, if you want to come along, <laughs> where there's a lot of people uh, all talking in a public messaging environment. So it's, a, it's not sequential decision making. Rather, it's, uh, it's cheap talk in a, in a different kind of world. But uh, anyway. Uh, one thing that's not kind of neat about that is that it's the same mechanics, and it turns out as you have more and more agents, we have the span of control thing, which uh, Gagliotti, Giglino, and uh, Squintani refer to as congestion effect, which is evocative, but I had, I was, had a horrible cold this winter, and so I just, I can't use that. Um, just bad memories. So I refer to it as the span of control effect. Well, that haunts that model, too, where you have lots of agents all talking at the same time, and what's really sort of neat is that there, there is a finite upper bound on the number of truthful agents, and that paper kind of looks at like, well, what mix would you rather have, agents with real authority versus agents with lots of signals? Um, anyway, so that's just a plug for my work. Delegated discretion with multiple agents. Uh, this is weird, and we don't really do it in this paper, and we probably won't, not being glib, because it becomes a very big optimization problem for all the wrong reasons. Very 1970s, you know, going to write it up in Fortran 77 and figure it out. Because the fact of the matter is, is I give authority, say, to Roger, and then I give some to Ethan. Well, the fact that I just gave some to Ethan reduces how much authority I have, and that affects the calculation of how much I need to give to Roger to be truthful to me. And also questions of, does Ethan get to observe Roger's decision? These all matter. And you can do it, but it's algebraically big. So it could be fun, but 
Depends on your definition of fun, I guess. It's all endogenous. Uh, <laughs> and finally, um, you can, another interesting angle to go with this uh, particular framework is the idea of transparency with multiple agents. And so uh, my paper with Maggie, one of the questions that's in there, we observe, eight, we, we allow for multiple agents to go in sequence. So one agent makes a decision before another agent who then makes a decision. And then the final agent might observe only the second agent's decision or so forth. And we only go to three. That's enough. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty big. So there's some interesting uh, both technical and uh, substantive questions about, well, if agents observe each other's choices in sequence, when do you actually want transparency in a sense sort of bottom-up transparency versus uh, opacity? Okay, and I'm happy to talk about it. It's weird. Um, but in short, and again for the aspiring you know, organizational modeler out there, this framework is, is feckened. It's just really great. It's, that's credit to the earlier authors, not to, not to me and Sean. But I, I really like this, this framework. Of course, the, the you know, discussants are about to tell you why you shouldn't like it. But finally, the conclusions, uh, just to reiterate, transparency again, one of the big findings I think here that's sort of interesting to me at least is that top-down transparency can hinder information aggregation, which is something that I wasn't really necessarily expecting. Uh, at least I wasn't. And then secondly, this idea of uh, more information from the, that the principal has, regardless of whether it's observable or not, if he or she has more information, at least in this environment, I, more people are reporting to him or her truthfully, then it actually is harder to get uh, anyone with divergent preferences to be truthful with that principal. And then finally, again, as we went through with, the, with this picture, we can see that basically delegating Authority can help ameliorate the effects of this, but it, it can't eliminate them. For sufficiently large biases, too bad. Okay, and uh, and the same the same sort of cutoff feature would also happen if you thought about parameterizing in terms of the numbers of signals that the agent has versus the principal and so forth. And with that, I will yield the floor. First, very I, I'm not going to repeat the whole model. That would be very boring for you to hear it three times. Um, but just just to to make sure we're on the same page, the key elements of the model is that there's an uncertain state of the world that both the principal and the agent want to hit with their actions, but there's a bias. And we can, without loss of generality, of course, we can just set the principal's bias to zero. So there's this bias to the that the agent has. And alpha is the weight on the um, agent's action, meaning how influential that action is to the welfare of both parties. So that's the basic setup of the model. Um, there are, of course, information. Both the agent and the principal get a signal about, about theta. And it's important in the setting that the principal also gets a signal realization. This will allow us to talk about transparency. So the main analysis trying to figure out is there an interaction between delegation and transparency. So the way I see sort of the key results is that when we're in a cheap talk setting and setting alpha equal to 0, makes the agent's action merely a, uh, a message to the principal, this is what I would do. It turns out that transparency is of no consequence. Okay? And I'll discuss why that is in a minute. Whereas under delegation, where, where the agent's action has some consequence, both for his welfare and for the principal's welfare, in that case, transparency might be good or bad. There's going to be a trade-off. All right, so let's try and understand why this is. And let's go in sequence, first talking about cheap talk, and then talking about delegation. So in cheap talk, we have a proposition that a separating equilibrium exists if and only if the bias is less than 1 over 2m plus 6, where m is the number of independent signal observations the principal sees. The punchline of this proposition is eliciting information from the agent is harder when principal is more informed. Now, what I really want to spend some time talking about is why is this the case? Okay, I think as, as you know, partly for lack of time, John did not spend a lot of time talking about this, so I want to really distill what element of the model is it that makes this the case. And I believe this is the basic intuition. When M is high, okay, that's when the principal has a lot of information, a lie will tweak, will move a little bit what the principal believes. Okay, there's very little variance in the principal's posterior. So if I lie to him about what I know, I'm going to move his beliefs a little bit. When the principal knows very little, lies will swing his belief. Okay, they'll move him by a lot. And that matters. Okay, tweaking and swinging are, in a sense, instruments that are differentially valuable. Okay, tweaking is sort of like being able to surgically fix what the guy believes. 
And that's very tempting. Whereas swinging, sort of, you have this mallet, and you don't necessarily want to break the, 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 you know, his, his, his decision because you, know, you're, you're, you, might be, you might be reasonably well aligned. So tweaks can be tempting when swings are not. But it can't be the case that a swing is tempting and a tweak is not. Okay? If a swing is tempting, then a tweak in that direction is also tempting. Okay, so this is why it is harder to get people to be truthful when their lies can be small. When only big lies are allowed, then people are willing to be truthful. Okay, I think this is what's driving the result. Now, how does that come out in the model? Why is principles information linked to the size of lies? Here, it turns out that I think an assumption which might at first reading seem like simply an, something made for ease of exposition, OK, so we talked about a uniform theta, a binary signal realization, is not actually only being present for ease of exposition. It's driving the result. I think there is no inherent link between how informed the principle is and how big a lie has to be. That comes solely from the size of the signal realization space. OK? Here, the signal realization space is binary. And that means because of this core signalization space, that's what links how much the principal knows and the size of the lie. Okay, suppose that the agent instead got a signal realization, which was some on a continuous signal realization space. Okay, he just saw the truth plus epsilon. Now, even if the principal is uninformed, I can still tweak his beliefs. Okay, so there is this link between tweaking and, and principal's information, which seems potentially an unintended consequence, what initially may seem as just a simplifying assumption. I think there's, there's more dead bodies buried in the assumption of binary S than might have been intended. Okay, I'll, I'll return to that in the conclusion. Let's go now, this is cheap talk, let's talk to delegation. Fix some alpha bigger than zero. Okay, so now agents action impacts both agents and the principal's welfare. What is the impact of agent observing principal signal? John provided very good intuition about this, okay, so I'm not going to spend much time repeating it. There's a benefit of reduced variance of the action, but there's a cost. The cost is that lies are cheaper, okay, under transparency. Why is that? Well, under transparency, the agent is assumed to take one of these three actions, okay, the actions which are optimal given his information. One quarter plus bias, one half plus the bias, or three quarters, depending whether we have zero, one, or two successes. Whereas without transparency, it takes one of these two actions. So that means that under transparency, lies tweak. To lie, I tweak the action that I take. Okay, I can take an action that's just a quarter away from what I would in order to achieve a lie that might mislead a principle. But under opacity, lies swing. Okay, I have to move my action by a third, which is more than a quarter. Okay, so here tweaking and swinging are a little bit close, but I thought this would kind of unify the presentation. Um, so I kind of have to swing my action by a larger amount in order to convey a lie. Now, is this inherent? Is there something that should be a feature of a more general model that transparency is linked with? how much I have to tweak my action to lie. And again, I'm not sure this is fundamental to models of this space. In fact, there is another equilibrium, OK? There's an equilibrium under transparency where we have actions where I tweak my action by a third when I want to lie. Now, this is assumed away by the off the equilibrium beliefs assumption which was mentioned, OK? That th th this is the... This was sort of, there wasn't much discussion of it where the agent behaves in a naively, sequentially rational way. That said, no standard refinement rules out this equilibrium. Okay, this is, satisfies, this is a sequential equilibrium. This satisfies all the divinity properties. You know, it's D1, it's D2, it's anything you want. So it's an equilibrium. Okay, so that makes me a little bit worried that this link between transparency and cost of lies may not be as, as fundamental as one might sort of think on the first reading of the model. So let me sort of summarize these two main points. Obviously, there's other parts to the paper, but partly in the interest of time, I kind of try to focus on these two parts, which I think are, are, are central, and I think I can kind of see them in an integrated way. 
The results on cheap talk are based on the, on, on, on the distinction between tweaking versus swinging principles beliefs. And that seems fundamentally true, that when you can only make big lies, you're more likely to tell the truth. I think you're going to get that in any model you're ever going to write down. Okay, That just seems really robust. The link between principles and information and whether you tweak or swing does not seem to be robust. It seems to be contingent on what seems to me at least as a I'd like to think of the size of the signal realization space as a kind of assumption we don't want to drive results. Okay, perhaps that's a matter of taste, but at least that seems right to me, especially because we talk about is this meant to be a model of a real world environment? What kind of information structure is it where I only get one of two signal realization? Okay, our information tends to be finer, so I think tweaking might be possible even when principle is informed. On delegation, again, it's about tweaks versus swings in agents' action. Here, I think, is even more worrisome that the link between transparency and the size of the action move I need to engage in order to lie, here I think is driven entirely by the equilibrium selection, which may be, I mentioned that there's very good reasons for that equilibrium selection. I'm not sure what they are, but they're all the more important because this link very much depends on that, on that selection property. Okay, overall I think this is an elegant novel modeling framework for delegation. Um, it is fundamentally distinct. I think, from the standard setup of delegation, going back to you know, Holmstrom and Niko Matuszek's work with, with delegation sets, okay, this is a very different notion of what it means to delegate, where I'm kind of increasing the weight and how important your actions are. It's an elegant model. I'm sort of very happy that, that it's tractable and it gives out interesting results. Um, the basic intuition in, in this way of modeling delegation is, is the following. By yielding a decision right, to an agent, I entice them to reveal the information even though I will then use it, that information against them, so to speak. right? Because the idea is I let you control a small part of the company and you're willing to sort of use what you know to get that right, but then having observed that, I'm now in the other part of the company do stuff that you dislike. I find this to be A, novel, B, sort of theoretically interesting, but C, not particularly relevant for the applications which might have been discussed. When I, when I think about, say, the compensation czar, and think of that as being an instance of delegation, is it really the case that compensation czar is sort of, when he thinks about whether to take action A or action B, depending on what he knows, he's really worried that if he does this, it will become apparent to Obama that in fact he saw this action and then when Obama does something else he's going to do something different from what the czar wants. I'm not sure that most of the reasons for delegation are about trying to sort of create the setting where I'm trying to give you an ability to take an action which you're willing to take because you care about it enough but then because I saw you observe that action I'm going to go and do something opposite of what you'd want. So I think more work should go into trying to think of not just applications that involve delegation and transparency, I think those are many, but applications where this force that I elicit information that I'm going to use against the agent by having some consequence to the agent's decision, I think spending more time thinking about when that force is a primary force would really improve the, would really improve the paper. And that's all the comments I have. I, I quite enjoyed this paper. Um, I learned a lot. I too think that the basic framework is got lots of possibilities, lots of ways to take it that are interesting. And I think um, I'm, uh, if I were to say something, the sort of the summary of my criticism, such as they are, is I think that the possibilities are greater than the paper that's before us. That there are ways of taking this paper um, that are going to be really interesting uh, in delivering a set of novel results that I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, and the paper that's before. For us, there are um, it, it it doesn't deliver as much as I think what subsequent um, subsequent ones are going to do. So let me just say a, f a few things. Um, the first is, as was mentioned, we're thinking about an environment in which a, a single principal is looking at delegating authority to multiple agents, and they're delegating authority that allows the agents to take unilateral action. 
right? It's to go out and act on their own. It's not giving them authority as sort of a, a seat at the table in the shared project of creating a new policy. It's sort of like deputizing citizens to go out and collect criminals or something. And you'll, right? So that's the first sort of notion. Um, the, the second is that. Um, the whole point of the deputizing the people is not because it necessarily advances your particular policy interests so much as it elicits, it's, 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 the, it's the thing you need to give up in order to elicit information about this private signal that the agent observes. That's the only reason in this world to delegate. So there isn't a, a part of delegation models where there's an acquisition of expertise or something that you're trying to convince them to pay the costs of acquiring expertise so that, um, so that then um, you know, better policy will be made. It's that you know, they're going to get a signal no matter what, and you would like to believe the signal um, that they tell you that they got. Right? That's the whole reason for, for, for doing so. And, and this signal, as, as Amira was mentioning, is it's a really coarse signal. It's not a signal that can be adjusted. Right? So, so it's, it's coarse, and this, this, the, 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 the principle excuse me, the agent can't tell the principal more or less information, right? Be more or less precise. They can be truthful or not, full stop. Okay, so what do they find? Some, some of the findings are, are, are rather standard. You see more likely to observe truthful revelation of information when the preferences of the principal and the agent are conformed to one another to a greater extent. And you're, you're more likely to observe a delegation of authority Similarly, when um, the preferences of the two can um, converge, the principal and the agent. And then part of what then a lot of the work of then the paper is then thinking about these two moves, right? One is let's compare the, the, um, the cheap talk setting to the case uh, under which authority is delegated and try to think about what's going on in these two cases. And two, trying to think about um, mapped over that, the significance of what they're calling top-down transparency um, for the elicitation of um, truthful information about the, 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 the signal that the agent observes. And what they show, right, is that top-down transparency um, is, it doesn't matter in the cheap talk setting. Uh, it doesn't have any bearing, but it appears to have a, a, a couple of implications conditional upon authority being delegated, a conditional upon people being deputized. Um, and in particular, what it has the effect of doing, and this is the graph that was shown, right, is that it expands the, the um, it makes the, the range of, of, the, of space, the continuum under which delegation occurs is going to be longer, provided the information that the principal has is not made available to the agent. And in turn, the amount of authority that's required to be delegated by the agent to the principal is lower. OK, so these are sort of core findings. And um, I, I think here's the, here's the thing that I would push for. I think for the verses you suggested that you know, you're thinking about cutting or cutting down on the applications, I would drop them uh, altogether. I, I think that there, there are a bunch of reasons why they don't quite map on to the story that's being told here. Another one is that, well, at least when I think about these advisory agencies, it's a, it's a group of individuals getting together who are then sending a single report to, for you, right, the president, right? And that's not what the, what's going on in the model, where you have separate individuals given separate amounts of authority to go out and do stuff, sending separate signals to a principal. Um, so, uh, in that sense, it's about you know the acquisition of information, um, and that's why we'd have an advisory committee. But this sort of the structure of the model doesn't map on kind of nicely, and I would just do away with it. What I wanted to hear more about, and why I'm I'm really excited about where this is is, is going, and it sounds like we've already got papers doing this, are instances where we have multiple um, agents. What's going on when we have multiple? That isn't solved in the paper, but that's where I see the kind of big payoff from using this technology. And there are a variety of ways in which um, we might want to think about the, how we might adapt what's going on here to the world in which there are multiple agents and we're solving for it. So imagine, for instance, you have uh, multiple agents receiving a, with heterogeneous preferences, receiving a, a single signal, right? And then how, what? How then do they get aggregated? And, and in turn, what do heterogeneous agents receiving a single signal, who in turn have to send a 
a single single to a principal, how does that work, right? I don't, I don't know how that works. It'd be interesting to see how that, how that works. Um, also, how then do agents communicate with one another in a world in which they're receiving separate signals? And how do they communicate with one another? And in turn, what do they then communicate to, um, to, the, to the principal? Um, so, oh, and then, and then also thinking about, I don't know, shared, shared tasks. So this is, again, where I think my discomfort in thinking about the relevance of this for the outside world is this, again, this idea that we're deputizing individuals who are going to be in charge of a specific policy space as opposed to thinking about here is a, a, a body of agents, a group of agents, who are going to be given some authority which will allow them to either work alongside the principal or are going to have to work together in some particular policy project. Striking me as more consistent with the kind of models of, I mean, the, sort of the, 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 the applications that, that you guys had in mind, but that's not sort of the technology that's being played out here. But like I said, I mean, I, I, I learned a lot from this paper, and thanks. The binary signal, there's no bodies buried there, really, because, um, it, well, there is one. It's like on, the corpse is on the ground, right? It's not really buried, which is that um, you, can, you can do this analysis with the, um, with the agent getting lots of signals, right? And that's in the limit approximating the crawford sobel world, right? He's going to know. And so in the crawford sobel world, it's a limit case where you have to have exact preference agreement to have truthfulness because of exactly the point you're after. So I, I don't, the binariness is, oh. Hello. <laughs> uh, get the clams. Um, so the, you're right that the binariness is driving a lot, but any finite, any coarse world, you're going to have the same qualitative aspects. And so this is like the, the simplest one because of the fact that I think if you want to do the generalization, which I've worked a little bit on and I encourage others to look at too, you can think about the how smart do you want your agent to be because if your agent is too smart, then they can't be truthful with you. And so there's, you know, this is a model of, of Brownie or something. <laughs> Why do we hire idiots? Because maybe they'll be truthful with us. Um, so thank you. But I wanted to make sure that that was clear that I don't think that there's any it's not driving anything other than the fact that what it is trying to drive, which is that you can get non-trivial truthful communication, right? So you need some coarseness for that, because we know Crawford Sobel, you're not going to get truthfulness in an analytically just clear, just clear just way. Remember, this, is, this is partly because you're insisting on completely separating polarities. Sure. You were just interested in the amount of information that gets revealed. Sure, yeah, yeah. So you could then go back to continuous signals. And the question, really, that I'm, that I'm stressing is, is there an inherent link between how much the principal knows and how easy is it to communicate information to a principal? And I right. think that link gets broken if you have a Crawford Sobel setup. So, OK, thank you. Because that's actually not true. Because what's, what's being driven here is the fact that I'm only going to be truthful with you. Just let's be quick and dirty about it. If um, m manipulating you would lead you to make a decision essentially on the other side of my ideal point conditional upon the true state of nature. And that's a, that's a feature of Bayesian updating, right? So. If I'm giving you one piece of evidence, however you're going to update upon it in a truthful equilibrium, so you're like, well, you observe something. I don't care what it is, but it, not Crawford Sobel where I actually observe the true state, but I observe a, a noisy signal. So that it's not the coarseness. It's the fact that I'm going to only move you a little bit, right, when you have a lot of information. That's just Bayes' rule, right? So that's in any world where basically I'm throwing something on top of your pile of information that you've used. And so if you want to say, well, I can come up with worlds where there's a lot of, you have a lot of signals that aren't very informative, but the agent signal is really informative, I'd be like, well, that's a relabeling. But I mean, I agree with you that, there, you know, that's being driven by the informational technology, which is that uh, the agent here can only manipulate. I mean, your, your tweaks and swings is exactly right. And thank you. That's a, I like that, that framing. So I just want to, I don't, it doesn't have anything to do with the signal space. It has to do with the, the principal's beliefs and, a, and accordingly sequentially rational policy setting in this quadratic loss environment. And finally, uh, thank you very much about the off the equilibrium path aspect too. I'm happy to send you the most exciting proposition that I've proven in a long time. That's a very low bar. Uh, so it turns out in this world, when the alpha A is positive, I've shown this three or four times. I've told Ethan about it and Sean about it, and I, I can send you the proof. Given the common knowledge of betas, I can always find beliefs for the principle such that truthfulness is incentive compatible, period regardless of what beta is, okay? Using the same kind of trick you were doing. So set a bias, make you be, you wouldn't do what you did, you would actually, because you know the direction of the temptation, you must say, you've got to really prove it to me that you got the tempting signal. And that's, I can satisfy incentive compatibility as long as alpha is positive. And so you're exactly right, refinements don't rule any of those out, except for, as, as Maggie put it, the just common sense refinement, <laughs> because 
the welfare of those equilibria are horrible because in half the time you have to do something really extreme. You have to go out and kill your brother, you know, sort of like Old Testament signaling, right? <laughs> but, but you're being truthful. You know, like, I guess you got it. And so I completely, and so it's an interesting theory, pure theory topic of like, well, why can't, why aren't we going to see those? But at some level from the app application standpoint, we don't, you know, in terms of your very well aimed comment about like, is this the right application, the right way to think about it? We don't see that kind of signaling equilibrium Again, outside the Old Testament. Um, but again, thank you very much for the, for the comments. Very, very helpful. So the logic of the refinement is a welfare dominance? Logic of the refinement is uh, the logic of the refinement, there is, we're just, we're choosing that equilibrium. I don't, I mean, I can, we can talk about, but that's the equilibrium we're looking so at. You're choosing it as because of a, it's better for welfare. Than it's a little hard to think about it. Uh, and, and the reason is because if you go to welfare and, and start thinking about refinement relative to those really weird truthful equilibria that require extreme messaging, extreme policy for messaging, you have to then consider the mixed strategy equilibria if you're going to start doing a welfare comparison. And I don't want to. You know, just to be perfectly blunt, I don't want to do that. But this is the sort of 60s Bayesian decision theory naive best equilibrium, right? It's just like everybody's like setting policy. You know, it's, you could tell a story about ex post credibility and so forth. Like the voters come in and be like, well, if, if you're signaling that that's actually truly what the, your signal is, you should set this policy instead. So, I mean, I, it's a, from an applied modeling perspective, I'm just, that's the equilibrium I'm looking at. And there's a ton of them. Um, from a game theory standpoint, it's a fast, it's sort of a fascinating question. But again, a lot of that's driven, as Amir was correctly putting about by a lot of the aspects of the, of the world. Because those types of equilibria are definitely being driven by the coarseness of the signal that you can do all this. So it's fascinating for those of you who want to go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> I took Amir's comment to be something about your answer to Amir was about, well, if you have this information or that information, then either you're going to move them a lot or you're not. And I took Amir's comment to be, the problem with the signal space is that it means that the kinds of things I can then tell you are very limited. I can either tell you one or zero, right? And if you imagine a more continuous signal space, that, a more continuous set of signals that I could get, then I can send you a set of messages which move <coughs> Bit, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, well, the easiest. No, I completely agree. I mean, I, I, I was just saying, I, the court, the binariness is actually not really driving s some of those facts because I can say you got 75 independent signals like this, and what you're going to communicate to me essentially in equilibrium in a in a separate equilibrium is a number between zero and 75. Right? That's all I care about is how many successes did you see given this informational environment. And that's closer, again, in a very well-formed but not ex you know, exhaustive way to a continuous signal. Right? You have more information. There's more, and there would be crawford sobel esque partitional equilibria that, again, I'm not personally interested in. But you could do, like, while well, you send a, a yeah, message for zero. Now I can move you a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. It seems like the link that Amir wants to break is broken. I don't, I don't know what the, okay, maybe I misunderstood what the link is. Suppose that you have a continuous signalization space, uh -huh. okay? And now, right. of course, we have partitional equilibrium. We don't have equilibrium equilibrium. What we're interested in now is asking, as we vary the principal's information, right. is it the case right. that we get more informative equilibrium? You right. find our partitions or, or, or say... I mean, I, I, I like that well-posed problem. Let, let's go to the world of continuous signals, you know, continuous information. And, and, and the conjecture and, I have is in that, that world might, yeah. of continuous signals, there'll be no link between the, say, the most informative equilibrium attainable and the amount of information the principal has. I think that link Maybe. depends on the link between principal information and, and the tweaking capacity. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's going to be true, and you know, we have to go. I think that's right. And the issue is not that what we were, you were talking about is you know it's just Bayesian. If you have a lot of information, extra information doesn't move your posterior all that much. The, if the principal has a lot, and that's going to be true, but you can choose to reveal a little bit. In, so in, the, in the continuous, uh, that, so that's the yeah, issue. yeah, no, no, and, and, and I think the principal is well informed, but when they're poorly informed, the agent can choose to make them just a little more. Informed. They cool. But, but yeah. Thinking, I I don't. I mean. Uh, you know, is this a limitation of the modeling framework? I mean, do I have to have a framework that where everything works with a continuous model, otherwise I bury the body? I mean, but it's not right. just something you know, like anything I can do to kind of garble any or to signal. Any, any, that's right. And, that, and so they're forced to garble. You know, they're, they 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 can't. Right. You know, they can't choose to reveal just a, just a peppercorn of information. But I, I mean, I guess I don't know. If, I take the point that a real signal space is going to be more refined than binary, but it's not unique to binaries. 
question. Yeah. It, it's you need to find that. And so yeah. I mean, I, 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 I mean, do, do I really want to? You know, do I? Is, is, do you really, is that the hill you really want to die on? Is that you know this? Yeah, this is like the literally. macabre, you know, like bodies buried, <laughs> hell to die on today, you know, the sun in my face. We assume a continuum, not because we think it's descriptively accurate, but because it's it's usually easy. So, so I, I think, but I think the point, you know, is it the fundamental logic of this kind of delegation world that this type of result happens? Maybe it's not, because you could you could you could kill it in a continuum. There you go again. Right. Um, kill, and you could kill it in a continuous signal space, but still, you know, there's there's a lot of so right, and so I will. I will make another point, which I think is I, I'm happy to see all this broken. But I, in, in this particular environment, there are two things that are really driving a lot that weren't mentioned. And it's not just this model. Quadratic loss is driving everything. Is it the only incentive compatibility constraint that's really buying, binding in any case is the small eyes, as you pointed out. And that's true. I mean, if I ha and so I've done in other papers, like suppose I have 15 signals that I'm trying to signal to you somehow. If I have an incentive to lie at all, it's because I have an incentive to tell you 12 instead of 11, right? It's never, you know, I mean, I might have an incentive to tell you 15 instead of 10, but if that's the case, and as you correctly pointed out. So that is something that those, that functional form is always going to be there, as long as we assume this quadratic loss. And so I don't think that that has anything to do with messages, because that has to do with me thinking about manipulating you. When do I want to manipulate you? I always want to manipulate you first for small lies, right? And that's just because of the spatial world and the quadratic loss. And the second thing that I think is, is really important in this particular world with the transparency, one of the reasons that it's costly, I didn't say this, one of the reasons it's more costly to incentivize truthfulness in the top-down transparent world is because you know, I ha you know exactly your incentives in all situations, and so I have to insure against the worst case Right? Even though I'm, I'm only going to be in that case one quarter of the time, I have to consider the case where you're sort of, you know for certain that you can manipulate me by exactly one quarter, right? Where in opacity, uh, you know, it's easier for me to buy incentive compatibility for you because you don't know exactly how tempted you are. And I think that that, again, modulo modeling choices would probably, that, that's, that's also a general, you know, that's not us, right? That's sort of like, don't let people know exactly how tempted they are and ask them, would you take a bet right now that you would prefer to take this rather than see if you're tempted, right? And you always will buy that off because of the risk aversion. So, but again, thank you for the comments. And I, I completely agree that the, the, the leaving the core, putting the coarseness in there as opposed to continuous, yeah, that's, it's driving a lot. But as Randy Calvert said, all the, all the stuff we're getting here are essentially the best partitional equilibria in the same crawford Sobel world. Right, and, that, and that's what the, that's why I think the genius of the Gagliotti, Gaglino, Squintani is they're like basically we're 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 looking at any we're looking at the situations in which information could be transmitted in some equilibrium in the Crawford Sobel, and then we're just going to say okay now let's move on as opposed to dealing with all those indifference conditions, which ugh, haunt me. But anyway, thanks again. Do so you have an answer to the application? <laughs> See, I always start with applications first. Uh, you know, contra the contra. Especially since all the kind of subdelegations of that type I, I can think of fit more into kind of a blame game kind of story than, a, right. than, than an information transition story of this type. Well, you know, I've, I've, I've written lots of papers. I, we have a paper coming out called Stovepiping, and I sent Sean a paper a earlier that was called stovepiping, and, and Sean sent back and was like, that's really cool, and I like stovepiping as an idea, but this is not a model of stovepiping. So then I wrote another model that wasn't awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I don't, I don't have a problem. I think that the comments are right. These, you know, and I, and I agree that this is not the primary behavioral determinant of organizational design, period. Although I'm, I also make a joke that if, I, if my model captures exactly how people think, I didn't need to write the model down. So I think that there's, a prescriptive side to these kinds of organizational models say, well, one thing you ought to think about, Dean, when you structure the reporting, you know, system with the chairs of the departments. And so my real world examples actually come from, you know, my own kitchen, so to speak. So I see, I think about this when I design systems with my daughter, right? <laughs> like, what kind of food do you want to eat? Well, you know, if I'm going to make her eat it, she's more likely to be truthful. I'm not sure why I care what food she wants to eat, but because uh, I love her, that's different, that's altruism. Just in those examples of the czars of the special masters, the special masters don't really get any part of that pay. It's hard to see how they're getting the payoff associated with their decisions, right? Like, can really? I mean, Right. They care about the policy outcome, right? I mean, the argument, I mean, whether, Feinberg's great because he's not exactly, a, he's like, it, it's weird, right? It's just a, but that's why you start out to talk with that, right? Get everybody going like, that's not what this is a model of. But more generally, I think those are all kind of sub-delegations that kind of are, obviously so, so that the principal can avoid having to make certain decisions. 
So you think it's blame, blame shift? It's more blame yeah, shift. Yeah, we, we were talking about writing the paper about that, and I'm not, I don't, I, I don't accept, I don't understand why anybody would then shift the blame, because you know where that guy got his authority from, and you know why they got it. Well, that's why you need a, a, a subtle theory to explain it. Well, but I think this is not yet, this is not yet a paper about no. Yeah, I mean, at some Anything, level, those are better. sense that our work is about a thing. Those are better, thing. better thought of as examples of the fact that the kinds of um, sub-delegation of authority actually occurs rather than the motivations in those examples are mirrored by our model. So, because a lot of this is sort of, we're saying, we're going to take our tr traditional model to three players kind of thing, you know, and you, so from the standpoint of journals and professionalism, it's, there's a lot of people like, why do I care about this n next model of bureaucracy? And so hopefully there's sort of proof of concept. Like there's a lot of questions that the standard Hol Holmstrom model wouldn't necessarily speak much to because it, there's only a few moving parts. So we're basically saying, we're going to put some new moving parts in and maybe someday they'll be applicable <laughs> to these things, but I maybe not. that's like a lot of the delegation literature, you know, delegation with finite sets and, you know, optimal delegation, they're not about anything. I don't know why I kind of feel bad about the fact that this isn't a model of something, you know? <laughs> when we think about delegation and some consequences of it, but it's not about a thing yet. The economists never write models about things. I'm glad to see you embracing this, Sean. <laughs> so, I really like this message. Well, but it, it doesn't have it. Maybe one day somebody else will figure, maybe it'll be us to figure out what, the, what it's actually about. But. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bearing my soul to you people. Be gentle. <laughs> it's not about a thing yet. It's just not. We've had shows about nothing, I don't see why we can't have models of nothing. <laughs> Very well, successful. Of about nothing. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Thank you.